after over a decade of waiting, the full-blown sequel to my favourite game from my favourite video game developer studio, Alan Wake 2, is almost here. With all the excitement that brings, I thought that now would be a great time to revisit the original game and the remaster in a series bringing together some of what we've seen over the years. There's a lot within this world, especially now that it forms part of the Remedy Connected universe, so this won't be absolutely everything. I encourage any player of these games to dive down the wellspring of connections and theories. I know I've spent endless hours doing that. Of course, this will contain spoilers across the franchise, so please, please, don't continue watching if you have yet to play this gem of a game, or indeed, investigate particular documents in Control and its AWE expansion. I'll wait. Before we move on to the third episode, let's take a look back at the events leading up to this point. Alice has been kidnapped. Alan, please help me. Alice? You'll do exactly what I say if you ever want to see your wife again. I can't tell anyone except my agent, Barry. Damn it, Barry, the killer! You're my best friend, and I'm worried that you're not right in the head. The ransom is a manuscript I supposedly wrote that's coming true before my eyes. It happened just the way it was on that page. So... Dark. I have found only a few scattered pages. I want the entire manuscript. The deadline is in two days. I found Mr. Wake's pages. Good girl. How the hell did she get her hands on the manuscript anyway? I don't know. She's resourceful. I told you you were too hard on her. Listen, I found out all sorts of interesting stuff while I was digging around. Yeah. Mr. Wake, it's Sheriff Breaker. We have an FBI agent here, Agent Nightingale. FBI? He's anxious to see you. You'd better come to the station. Okay, I'll be right over, Sheriff. Let's make this quick, huh? Help you folks. Name's Randolph. I'm the manager. We're looking for Rose. Works as a waitress down at the diner. Rose, sure. Nice girl. Who wants to know? I'm Alan Wake. The writer, huh? I heard on the radio you were visiting. Well, I'll show you her trailer. That Rose, she's a nice girl. Always pays her rent on time. Uh, the trailer park where Rose lives uh, is a cozy place that recently had a bit of a shock when a sailing boat picked up by a tornado crashed in the middle of two trailers. Uh, this is a location that for a long time looked like it was not going to make it in the final game. But I'm glad it did, because I think it's one of those places that helps define the character and style of the game in a visual way. Uh, when we went out photo shooting uh, along the Pacific Northwest area, we came across many trailer parks and uh, we have plenty of material for them. So I think that really shows in the authenticity of this location. As a writer, when I'm working on a story, I, I do like a bit of a guiding structure uh, for it. I mean, there are obviously very different uh, story structures out there. You know, your basic three-act structure, hero's journey and, and, and all. And, and I, I kind of use some of these as a, as a reminder to myself that, that whenever I kind of run into a problem in the story, then I glance back at these structures if there is any help to be offered. The hero's journey is present even in the naming of Alan's manuscript as Departure. The start of this episode gives us a lot of information through Barry's detective work. As I was saying, Al, I found all sorts of weird stuff from the local newspaper's archives. This place is crazy! Disappearances, mysterious deaths, urban legends come true, and, get this, most of this stuff takes place around Cauldron Lake. Well, you ain't wrong, mister. The Indians thought the lake was a doorway to the underworld. I'm the God-fearing type myself. I, I don't hold with that sort of thing. Yeah, okay. Anyway, 
there was an island there owned by a guy called Thomas Zane. Now, some of the articles I found about him make him out to be a famous writer, but I ran a bunch of searches, couldn't find a single thing he wrote. Zane was heavily into diving, so much so that the place came to be called Diver's Isle. But the volcano under the lake erupted in 1970, and Zane went down with the island. Yeah, how about that? It was there in the morning, as if it had fallen from the sky. But it would take a tornado to lift something like that. We're damn lucky it didn't crush any of the trailers. Come on, mister. I'll take you to Rose's trailer. Thomas Zane fell for Barbara Jagger. It happened fast. She was young, vibrant and beautiful, full of life. He had never been a very happy man, and without any seeming effort, she had changed all that. Zane felt good for the first time in his life. Everything she did was another piece of a jigsaw puzzle he hadn't even known he'd been missing. And best of all, she made the words flow, strong and sharp. She was his muse. It gets better. A local girl, Barbara Jagger, drowned in Cauldron Lake just a week earlier. They were lovers. Sure, Jagger's a local spook story. The scratching hag comes for you in the dark. Childish stuff like that. Anyway, Al, I'm just getting to the best part. All of the articles about this stuff were written by Cynthia Weaver. I asked around, and she's that crazy bag lady you met. What, the lamp lady? She can be a little loopy, but she's not homeless or anything. Yeah, anyway. She knew both Jagger and Zane before they both died, and she had some kind of a breakdown. Rose didn't know how the strange old lady got in her trailer, and she looked wrong somehow. The woman showed her teeth in an approximation of a smile and traced a finger down Rose's cheek. Pretty girl, she said. Rose felt as if she was falling asleep, but her knees didn't buckle. The crone spoke in a whisper, her words ice cold and dark in Rose's ear. Touched by the dark presence, Rose was lost in a dreamland where everything was drawn in black and gray crayons. The old lady had promised her that all her wishes would come true. She would be Alan Wake's muse. She was smiling so hard it hurt her face. She crushed a bottle full of sleeping pills into the coffee. Deep down inside, she was screaming in terror. Well, mister, this here's Rose's trailer. You mind me asking what you want with her? We're just here to talk to her, pal. Welcome to... to... Oh dear, Mr. Wake. I'm... I'm so glad you're here. Rose, you have my manuscript? Oh. Oh, yes. Yes. Please, come in. Hey, this is really good! Rose. Yes? My manuscript. I really need it. I understand. I know what you need. A muse to inspire you. Oh, for Barry? She doesn't have anything. Yeah, uh, hey, Al. Oh, what's... Oh. Barry! What? What? It's coming for you. Hiding in my barber's skin. I'm too weak to stop it. You must turn the lights on. I promised I'd come visit you and your lovely wife. You must finish what you started. I insist. You must turn the lights on. Turn the light on.
I felt nauseous, hung over. Only anger kept me going. I can't tell reality from dream anymore, but it seems I have an imaginary editor to help me. She's an old woman in a funeral dress. I call her Barbara Jagger. She's very strict. I I'm writing faster and faster. My manuscript is being heavily revised. The edits are getting very aggressive, and each day there's less of me and more of her. I hate it, but I know she's right. She promises me I can save Alice this way. She knows more of this than I do, about the complex incantation I'm attempting, about this place. She's worked with another writer under similar circumstances, Thomas Zane. The genre of the story seems to be shifting. It's turning into a horror story. I'm getting close. I can feel it. We see that Rose really is a huge fan with her shrine to the writer at the head of her bed, and the Alex Casey series on a nearby bookshelf. Rose took a day from me. I had less than 12 hours left to meet the kidnapper. All I could do was get Barry into the car, work something out once I got on the road. Barry was out of it. He was way too heavy to carry. You're right. I deserve more money. I'm so handsome. Welcome to the Oh Dear Diner. What can I get you today? Coffee? I couldn't work up much hate for Rose. Something had used her to get to me and left its mark. First refill is free. Mr. Randolph liked Rose, that little smile she had, how she was still sweet when life had tried so hard to make her bitter. It wasn't any of his business what she did in her trailer, but those strangers, the writer and his smart-ass sidekick, looked like trouble, and they'd been in there for hours, way past her normal bedtime. He reached for the phone and called the sheriff's station. A gun and flashlight. The Dark Presence is the main adversary in our game, and, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call it evil, but it is completely alien to our world, and that may pretty much be the same thing. Uh, we don't really want to explain the Dark Presence in too much detail, we kind of want it to remain a mystery, but... Let me say this much, it's definitely not human, it doesn't think the way we do. A good example of this would be when Wake actually escapes from the cabin. And he actually just sits there and writes the whole thing into the story and the Dark Presence is right there and it just doesn't understand what's going on. It doesn't work on that level of logic. On the other hand, it can be very devious. For example, it has no problems whatsoever using Alice and Rose against Wake in a very, very sort of, you know, contrived manner. And it works very well too. Uh, we talk quite a bit about the Dark Presence being weak in the beginning of the game. And that's true as far as it goes, but it only refers to the foothold it has in our world. Now, it is strong. It is very, very strong and very, very big in its own world. My gun and flashlight. Still talking gone. about the structure the uh, for the, the story. As as for for Alan Wake, more than anything, like as this kind guiding structure, I had uh, five stages of grief in my mind. Uh, and, and, and that comes to the idea of this being a psychological thriller. And, and a lot of this is about how our hero, Alan Wake, sees the situation. I mean, we, we have these crazy supernatural things starting to happen. And, and so we, we start from denial and, and he can't really accept it. And, and, and then we go through these steps of anger and bargaining and, and ultimately accepting uh, and embracing uh, this, this madness. And because it's psychological, we, we have this open question. Is this supernatural and is, or is he going mad and embracing the madness? Oh, you're going to get it now. <laughs> God knows what you've done to that poor girl. This is Agent Nightingale, FBI. Get him up, Hemingway. You're under arrest. You move a muscle, I'll unload right in your goddamn face. Stay right where you are, Slay. What 
Jedi! I'm standing right here, you goddamn maniac! I hated to leave Barry behind, but there was no way I'd miss my appointment with the kidnapper. Get up, Mr. Wake! Come on! It looks like Nightingale will be a pivotal character at the start of the sequel. I think it's worth delving into his character here, as Alan is on the run. The FBI agent's command froze me in place. I considered surrender. It was all falling apart anyway. I could give in, let someone else deal with it. But it felt all wrong. Cold instinct, his posture, the way he held the gun. He was no friend. Sarah trusted her gut, and her gut said Agent Nightingale was an asshole. He felt wrong, and it wasn't just the smell of stale booze. It was in the way he flashed his badge, pulled rank, the look in his eyes when he wanted answers. Where was Alan Wake? What was this about an accident? Where was his wife? And most importantly, why did she let Wake go? He wouldn't answer her questions. Federal business was all he'd say. I love how this section has a kind of reversal where the cops are hunting Alan, now hiding in the darkness, with their lights. Of course, this is another dark night of the week, but this time, it's the police who encounter the Taken. Agent Nightingale didn't want to be in Bright Falls. These little communities revolted him, and he didn't like the trees or the coffee. He now knew that impossible horrors lurked behind the storefronts and smiles. He desperately wanted to turn the car around and just drive until he passed out or ran out of road and booze. But he had a job to do. He had a rider to catch, at any cost. Of course, this is reminiscent of Alex Casey's line in the trailer. The victim was one of their own. FBI Special Agent Robert Nightingale. So you knew our victim? Only the rumors. He was chasing a writer. This horror was everywhere I went, circling me. The cops didn't stand a chance. They were after a writer, not a monster. Continuing our dive on Nightingale, a quick Google search links to a Wikipedia article stating that the bird of the same name is a symbol of creativity, nature's purity, virtue, goodness, and perhaps most interestingly, the muse. The darkness warps these symbols to a dark nature, and if we think about the muse, we remember Barbara Jagger, the skin of whom the dark presence wears. Even behind the closed doors and curtains of his grimy room at the Majestic, the local motel, Nightingale could feel the locals' eyes on him, the unrelenting pressure of their judgment. He forced it out of his mind. For all he knew, they could all be under Wake's spell already. You do what you have to do to get the job done. He took comfort from the bottle in his hand. Please, he thought, just let me get through this. I imagined that the broadcast tower in the distance was part of the local radio station. Maine seemed like a decent guy. Perhaps he could give me directions to the coal mine. Natural shadows clung to the gate. The darkness that was after me was trying to stop me. I wouldn't get through without them. Here, we see that Alan can intensify beams of light outside of his flashlight. There's more to fighting the Taken than just burning away the darkness that protects them. When I'm fighting for my life, I find myself slipping into a state of intense concentration that makes the beam of my flashlight seem more powerful and focused. I used to think it was just my imagination, something brought on by the adrenaline and fear of death. But now I'm not so sure. I've been touched by powers that I can't begin to truly comprehend. And they've left a mark. I'm starting to think this might be a part of it. It took me a moment so to... So Alan Wake is a psychological thriller. And, and for my we are on this journey into Alan Wake's mind. And if we think about psycho thrillers, you know, there is always that question on, is, is this true? Is this really happening? Or, or is this part of the madness? And, and if, if it's madness, is nothing true? But obviously we are on this journey together with Wake and he becomes to believe in it. And, and, and so must we, 
because otherwise the things that we are fighting for are not really there. We can see this in things like how the Taken disappear after being killed, and that the cabin shouldn't have been at Cauldron Lake. What happens when you go from a psychological thriller to a survival horror? A lot of this would continue in a sequel, but how will that change the guiding principles of the story? We don't see a lot of Pat Main in the game, but actually he has a considerable presence. One of the problems with Alan Wake was that we really wanted to maintain that uh, small town atmosphere, but that's very hard to do when, you know, you don't actually spend a lot of time in the small town itself. A familiar and dependable radio will solve that problem. Uh, also, I think RJ Allison, who plays Pat Main, did a wonderful job. He really nails the character and uh, it's so great to be alone in the dark and then hear that warm and dependable voice. I hope main could the big theme, to the obviously, in, in this thriller is fiction coming true. And, and a lot of effort uh, from our part writing this was to think about what does that mean and what are the limits. Uh, obviously, if we would have given Alan Way godlike powers to just change reality on a whim, uh, there would not have been much stakes in this. I hope Maine could lend me a car to get to the coal mine. Oh, here's a little surprise. The famous writer Alan Wake just walked in, folks. I'm gonna see if I can talk him into an interview. Come on in, Mr. Wake. Oh, I'm so glad you could find the time to do this, Mr. Wake. Nowhere to run now, Dan Brown. You back away from me. Don't hurt. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Everyone calm down. Put the gun down. We're all friends here, right? Cool your jets, Nightingale. We got him. Judas Priest! What the hell's the matter with you? There's a civilian in there. Nightingale stared through the broken studio window into the dark woods. He turned around, started to walk out, but Maine grabbed his arm. Young man, you almost shot me. You don't shoot off rounds at people like that. What's the matter with you? Nightingale shook his arm free, marched out. His cheeks burned with rage and humiliation. I had fallen off so many cliffs it was ridiculous. That's what you get for naming a book The Sudden Stop. It was probably good I hadn't had the chance to tell Maine where I was going. I'd have to lose the cops and find my own way to the mine. So changing reality uh, with his writing uh, has to be a struggle. It, it, it's hard uh, for him. As writing a good story is hard for us. So, so there is this metaphor uh, going on in this. And, and essentially what he can do is he can take existing elements and nudge them and, and, and tweak them. And, and in, in a similar way, I feel that story needs to feel true for it to be a good story. Let's go back to the vision of the previous episode. I saw visions carried by the ebb and flow of different dream states. They seeped in from the reality beyond. Things I had a connection to, but also things I couldn't possibly know. I used them in my writing to make it real, so that the parts that weren't would become so. And there were visions that I knew were not real, Ideas I had lost, often of Casey. I had written about him for years. I used them as well. The lies had to feel true for them to become true. Had I... Here we have another really well set up journey. The train depot and the bridge in the distance well visible from early on. As an interesting side note, this whole area was originally uh, just a minor, uh, minor branch not even a branch, uh, Alan Wake just basically had to get a car from, car from the forest and continue towards the mining museum. Uh, with months of iteration and looking at the possibilities given by the environment, we found out uh, that this area could have lots of poltergeist events, could have uh, 
the hidden routes and so forth, the bridge and the train depot all appearing far later in their development. This is an exciting insight into development. You've got to think that Alan Wake 2 has been in development for so long now. What roads were discovered along this journey? With Nightingale gone and the night wind blowing in through the broken studio window, Maine stared at Sarah. The sheriff looked away. Maine's voice shook with barely controlled anger. That boy's doing more drinking than thinking. I hope you know what you're doing, Sarah. He's got a sickness in his eyes. You take my word for it. He wants Wake for a reason, and it's not for anything good. There was no sensible reason for the power company work lights to be here. It was almost as if they'd been left for someone like me to use. In light, you can hurt them. The hunters were big, thick-set men, confident and at home in the woods. They were feeling good, running on beer, ghost stories, and camaraderie late into the night. It did them no good, as they were taken by the dark presence, sucked deep into a darkness far worse than any ghost story they ever told or heard. Hello? The most stubborn man I've ever met. Alice? Alice? Alan. Alan. I'm here. I'm so alone here. It's all gonna go to hell. You need to be careful. Cooperate. The connection had been terrible, but that wasn't the only thing that hadn't been right with the call. She sounded wrong somehow, but she had called me. Everybody knows the movie Poltergeist, but I wouldn't say that it was the origin for this idea. This game is about possession. It's about the dark presence taking over everything in the world. It started off with humans and, well, in the design, the inanimate objects were the next logical step. One of the hardest things to do was to convey intent. The objects don't have any body language, unlike the Taken. How we ended up with the current feature was that the lead writer actually encountered a problematic physical object. It flickered around the terrain erratically, and you really couldn't tell what is going to happen next. And that ended up being a real feature. And here you can see the result. Someone appears to be guiding Alan, and I heard what sounded like heavy breathing here that reminded me of Zane in the diving suit. itself loose from the bridge's steel framework. Wrapped in darkness, it floated in midair, twitching. For a moment, I didn't understand what I was looking at. The heavy object lurched at me with impossible force. I threw myself out of the way, but just barely. When I turned my flashlight on it, it shook in a dark rage before it flew at me again. As a teenager, just started to get interested in writing. Stephen King had been a source of inspiration to me. I thought about all the inanimate objects that had come to life in his books. No one is safe in a good horror story, certainly not the protagonist. That's what makes them fun. This was anything but. The darkness could possess anything, and it was getting closer. The dark person can take over almost anything. That includes machinery like vehicles. In the next scene, you will see the bulldozer attacking you, and it might be familiar to you from demos that have been shown in different shows before. 
I would like to say that plenty of thought and research went into this, but the fact is that it was basically just a lucky test when we fooled around with AI and physics. And here you can see the results. Even after all this time, hearing the Night Springs theme caused a surge of conflicting emotions in me. It'd been my first real writing gig. Barry had known a guy who knew a guy, and suddenly I'd been a semi-regular writer on the show. I'd always been ashamed of the job, felt it was trash. I'd wanted to be an artist, a novelist. I'd been naive back then. It had taken a long time to learn to be proud of the work. The bulldozer's engine roared to life. Mud and rocks flew as it fought for traction. It crashed through the concrete wall and landed heavily in the yard. If it were an animal, it would have shaken its head after the impact, fixed its eyes on me, and charged. Of course, it had no head, nor eyes. Shadows crawled on its form, twisting it into a monster. Then, it came for me. After defeating the bulldozer with the heavy duty flashlight, better transport is available. I had never been this glad to see the sunrise. I had a couple of hours to get to the coal mine. The coal mine wasn't far now. So I've been asked uh, a few times, like how much is Alan Wake, Sam Lake as a writer? And, and my, my answer is not really at all. But, but there is a certain kind of a truth to the idea that there are, of course, we, we always draw from our own experience. And I think that surprisingly, a few of the Remedy games in, in some way are metaphors and commentaries on video game development. Uh, this daytime driving sequence is great to have in the final game, especially considering the, that it was a source of debate earlier on. Uh, it's fairly hard to actually see these kind of sequences, are they actually working or not, before we have the final environment, the mood, the sounds and so forth. Of course, now it is great to have it in the final game. It provides a very nice change of pace in the middle of episode three, and it provides a great showcase for our technology, our views. And also, it's great to see the environment that you usually see in the night, covered in shadows and in fog, in its full glory. Today, I would meet the kidnapper, and he would give me Alice. I wouldn't give him any other choice. A drowning man will clutch at a straw. I'd come to believe that the story in the manuscript was coming true. The current of its narrative had taken me deeper and deeper into dark waters. Alice had been taken from me. Barry was probably in jail. I was a fugitive from the FBI. The whole world taken over by the dark presence was trying to destroy me. It all felt real, but it matched a textbook case of insanity. To find out what happened to Barry and Rose, we check the manuscript pages. Doc sat down heavily. He examined Barry and Rose. Barry was already recovering. Rose was another story. She was conscious, but she was barely present, almost delirious, disturbed, touched in the head, they used to say. It wasn't the first time Doc had seen someone in such a state, but it had been over 30 years. Doc poured himself a stiff drink. He hadn't forgotten a thing. This is a fun page from this episode. I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. In it, I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. In it, I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. In it, I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. In it, I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. In it, I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. To reach Mott, the kidnapper, Alan follows the road to get to the coal mine museum. So 
for the stories in our games as a metaphor of making video games. I mean, obviously, uh, in these past 25 years, a considerable amount of my life has gone into making video games and thinking about video games and struggling with the process of making video games. So it's not a surprise that these elements sneak in. Alan Wake in particular is a lot about the process of writing a story and struggling with, with writing a story. I mean, obviously we see glimpses of him struggling with it and, and, and thinking about it. So it was it, it, it's one of the reasons why why this game is so close to my heart that that because as a writer and thinking about these things and then being able to use them as elements in the story uh, felt exciting and and felt interesting uh, to me as a as a writer the feel of history and roots is somehow very present in the whole Pacific Northwest area uh, it's one of those things that uh, lends the unique feel to this region. This was once a very uh, inaccessible and thus isolated region, but in the turn of the 19th and 20th century, as railroads started getting built, uh, it was suddenly connected to the rest of the country. Uh, this greatly benefited industries like mining, for example, because now ore could easily be transported across vast distances. Towards 1960s and 1970s, mining steadily declined, uh, but this area is still filled with all sorts of landmarks and reminders of that once blooming industry. To me, these kinds of things really matter because they are the reason behind why things uh, are and look the way they are. So, long story short, uh, decaying uh, structures like old train carts and mining structures and temple buildings are really a part of the history of this area. And that's all the reason we needed uh, to include one of those beautiful tipple buildings as a location in the game. As many of its real-world counterparts, it serves now as a museum. I was early. I was supposed to meet the kidnapper at noon in the main building. The coal mine was quiet. It was a museum now. While there were some earlier residents in the area, the true genesis of the town of Bright Falls came with the founding of the Bright Falls Mining Company and the opening of the Bright Falls Coal Mine in 1878. Although the work was hard and dangerous, many immigrants, Germans, Poles, Italians, Finns and Swedes, among others, worked the mines. While lucrative at first, the mining steadily declined in the 20th century. The seams were rich, but hard to get at, and the volcanic activity in the area made the mine shafts particularly dangerous. In 1970, a volcanic eruption below Colgen Lake, while relatively minor, caused most of the deep mining tunnels to collapse or flood. 32 miners lost their lives in the calamity, and all mining around Bright Falls came to a final stop. Now, many of the remaining buildings are protected as historical landmarks. I didn't want to go outside. Cops had to be looking for me. The noon sun turned the place into a sauna. The day dragged on. Different scenarios ran through my mind. Ways of how I'd torture the kidnapper to get Alice back, or the different horrible things he could have done to her. I imagined her dead. I had no way of knowing she was still alive. It was killing me. I was running on blind hope. It was all a waste of time. The bastard never showed up. Wake! 
Where the hell are you? Change of plans. You know where Mirror Peak is? It's a big mountain north of where you are. You follow the path from the mine, you can't miss it. There's a lookout point there. I'll be waiting. I'm through being jerked around you by you. You want to see your wife alive? Because if you do, you better watch what you say to me. Do we understand each other? I want to talk to Alice. Yeah, and I want the manuscript. Don't keep me waiting, Wake. Hello? Hello! Ah! I'm gonna kill him! Uh, okay, now this whole kidnapping thing is a red herring, of course. Uh, it's just an attempt to manipulate Wake and to get him to deliver the manuscript. The so-called kidnapper, Mott, well, he doesn't have Alice, he doesn't know where Alice is, and neither does Dr. Hartman, the guy who's hired Mott. Uh, but they do know that Wake will do anything to get Alice back, so, you know, they use her. They're nice people like that. Um, the problem is that Wake doesn't have the manuscript at all. He doesn't know where it is, he has a couple of pages, but of course, that's not enough. So, uh, they're lying to Wake about having Alice, and Wake is lying to them about having the manuscript, and nobody has much of anything. It doesn't end very well for Mott, you know, who is going to get his in a couple of minutes, or, you know, a little longer. And uh, Dr. Hartman doesn't have such a great day either. You no, know, what can I say? Karma's a bitch. Now, in this commentary, I, I talk a lot about my own perspective and, and how I see these things, but it's always important to mention that making video games is very much a team effort. There, there are a lot of brilliant, uh, talented people uh, working at Remedy uh, and, and we're uh, working on, on Alan Wake. And, and there are a lot of inputs. Uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a writer, you have a story in mind and you refine it uh, to a certain point. But then you have a lot of people bringing interesting, cool, surprising ideas to the table. And, and, and then it's a challenge to kind of pick and choose, take those in and let them change it for the better. This is a game that's been in the works for over a decade now. How many people must have contributed in that time, even just through inspiration? Alan fights his way through the Taken to leave the mining site and plot a route to the lookout. There was no way the flashbang grenades were standard power company equipment. Our technology enables us to have a set of ready-made landscape types that tile seamlessly with each other and can be used to quickly lay out large sections of terrain, instantly creating realistic landscapes. These biotypes, as we call them, contain lots of different information about the resulting shape of the terrain. Things like what the ground is comprised of, is it mud, rocks or grass, and what grows on it, different kind of foliage and trees, and also its bumpiness. So we don't manually build every square meter of forest that there is in the game, but instead focus our efforts on creating these biotypes so realistic that they can be used to cover a patch of terrain of almost any size and still look realistic. We then cover the terrain with patches of different biotypes that go together very well before finally going over the area with a precision polish. For Alan Wake's story, a uh, lot of the backstory the we discover the along the way comes from 60s, 70s, and, 70s and even 80s. Now, I was born in 1970, and, and, and so kind of when I think about elements of, of Finnish uh, countryside and, and cabin life, uh, during summers, uh, it, it has this golden sheen on it that, that you often have, you know, when you are growing up. And, and when, when I think about the backstory of, of the 70s with the Birdleck cabin, uh, these are the kind of feelings and, and uh, images that I think about. I had no real plan. I was going to give the kidnapper all the manuscript pages I had for Alice. If that wasn't enough, I'd hold him at gunpoint and make him talk.
The dark presence was moving ahead of me in the same direction I was going. A cold feeling settled itself in the pit of my stomach. Was it going for Alice? He then fights his way through a graveyard against some of the quicker taken. The graveyard shift may cause cancer. The place was dead, a ghost town. Had been for decades, maybe a century. Originally founded in 1928, the Grey Peak Gorge mining town was one of the permanent settlements the Bright Falls Mining Company built for its workers. The nearby graveyard is a testament to the dangers the miners faced on a daily basis. Most of the men who lost their lives over the years here were buried there, a grim reminder to be careful for those who remained. Grey Peak Gorge was abandoned almost overnight when the Bright Falls Mining Company closed its doors in 1970. After defeating more possessed objects, Ellen sees himself on yet another television. Anything outside of riding is a struggle. I feel ill. I managed to make my way downstairs. There's a shoebox filled with books and papers by Thomas Zane. It's very hard to focus, but I managed to read some of it. He's a poet, and a good one. He writes of muses and creators summoning fabulous things from a magic lake, using his powers to shape the world of a realm of gods and dreams and demons, dark things that wait for a chance to slip through, wearing the flesh of men as disguise. Zane writes about himself, his girlfriend being taken over by a dark presence, about growing scared of the lake. Zane believes it's a mirror to the gaping void of darkness above, where some Lovecraftian presence lurks. I crawl back upstairs. I'll borrow these things from my story. They ring true. They fit. The kidnapper had sent me a text. The message was full of spelling errors and insults. It was telling me to hurry up. We chose birds as our only animal enemy type. The main reason being that the birds actually bring something new to the table, an extra dimension. We tried to think through the whole package of the player experience. The plan is to look down for bear traps, look ahead for Taken, and look up for the birds. The path leads to the silver mine, but the structure collapses, forcing Alan to find an escape route ahead. There's something very interesting in the mine that I found for the first time in this playthrough. Following Alice's voice led to what would seem to be some water from Cauldron Lake. Is this what led to the closure of the mine? The clear path to light gets blocked by the dark presence, landing Alan in an ambush. The guys who did this mind puzzle, Antti and Tiago, did a really amazing job here. Uh, this is again one of the cases where uh, we started with a very, very low-key design uh, requirement, just something to occupy the player for a moment. Um, but with iteration, looking at what works, what not, we actually got this, uh, this amazing sequence which does what it's supposed to do. It looks complex, it looks imposing, but it's very intuitive to play and I hope you actually enjoy going through it.
Past this puzzle, Alan escapes the mine. In a similar vein to how we handled the different types of terrain with biotypes, we have a preset system for weather styles as well. The game engine lets us control numerous parameters, things like cloudiness, wind, rain, and also lighting parameters, things like color, intensity, and blooming, to create truly stunning weather effects. Using this technology, we have created a palette of ready-made weathers that can be called upon at any time. So really, it is weather on demand at the push of a button. Each level has its own, or sometimes many, different styles of ambience, and so their own mood. After Alan Wake and his American Nightmare, Remedy moved to the fantastic Northlight game engine. The creation of Northlight came after early development of an Alan Wake 2 prototype, as the original Alan Wake engine limited the team's ability for storytelling. Remedy's next game, with the debut of Northlight, was the wonderful Quantum Break. In an interview, head of VFX, Johannes Richter, said on the weather system for Alan Wake 2, why is it systemic? Because we want to be able to control the weather without scripting. We don't want to be like, oh, this place, it will always be raining. In this place, it will always be windy. Because we use it a lot for storytelling. Instead, Richter explains, the wind picks up and then usually something happens after. And of course, that is very narrative driven and you never really know when you want this to happen. So it needs to be able to happen everywhere. Water is a part of this system too. We have different types of water. There's the lake, there's rivers and waterfalls, and all sorts of other things that you can encounter out in the woods. Sometimes we have flooded areas on the inside and all that kind of stuff is being supported by the system. This being Remedy, a lot of care was put into keeping the environment realistic. In the first game, the night sky was based off real stellar charts. In the upcoming sequel, scientific surveys of the Pacific Northwest have been referenced, accounting for altitude and species. And trees have been scanned thanks to the advances in that field over the past decade. There's something really creepy about having a full moon bright in the sky and having the Taken, with a weakness to light, be unfazed by it, except for the birds. Back on land, the writer continues on his journey to Mirror Peak, and along the way, he finds a sign. Let's piece together what we've seen in this episode. 32 miners died in deep mining tunnels that flooded in 1970. The mining town was abandoned almost overnight when the mining company closed down in the same year of 1970. Alan had a vision of Alice as he approached what looked like the lake's water in the mine. And this time, appearing as a tourist trap, with more than just no mention of casualties, but outright stating that there were none. The last eruption of the volcano was also in that eventful year of 1970. The sign describes the lake as a beautiful recreational area, but local folk tales gives us cause to think that what Alan is going through has happened not just in 2010, but decades, or maybe even centuries in the past. Folk tales are said to be passed down generationally through the spoken word. Alan finds a large residence and inside it a lot more of that yellow writing.
Cynthia Weaver, and Thomas Zane. TV could be a tether between the dark place and the outside world. Obsessive adoration surrounds the room, except for the final line. Why? After leaving the abandoned, worn down residence, we reach the kidnapper. Vermont, spying on the writer on the ferry had been a disappointment. His boss had made Wake Out to be something special, but Maud hadn't been impressed. I could see Cauldron Lake. I thought I could make out the spot where the island and the cabin had been. There was a light near it. It had to be a boat. I was close now. I had to get there fast. I dreaded what I would find. Wait! Are you? Wait! Hey, I'm here! I'm coming! Darkness surged towards me, sucking everything loose from the ground into its depths, tugging at my clothes. I saw the flare the kidnapper had dropped and threw myself towards it just as I felt my feet leave the ground. The darkness embraced me with the force of a tornado. Somehow I managed to light the flare. The darkness roared and cast me away. I fell toward the dark waters of the lake far below. Devil and he staked his claim. 